thing I like about gardening, um, which it has in common with music, is that you can enter gardening or music at any level and there are still thousands more levels to achieve. So I think it's endlessly interesting. You never stop learning with gardening or with music. Um, and the other thing they have in, in common is that you need a certain amount of technique with both gardening and music in order to convey what you're trying to communicate. My name's Simon Rickard and uh, I'm a gardener. Well, I moved here to Trentham about 14 years ago um, and this was just a big blank uh, square of land. And so I moved an old house up from Melbourne and uh, put it on the block and that is the sort of basis around which the garden's built. I live in central Victoria in the subalpine part of Australia and uh, here the winters are very long and so I wanted my garden to look beautiful through our long snowy winters. <laughs> So all of these plants come from uh, cool Mediterranean climates and they, uh, they do well in our natural climate without too much extra water or anything like that. So I've got things like the uh, Euphorbia rigida here flowering, which comes from, uh, comes from Turkey and Greece. Beautiful acid green coloured flowers that you're really glad for at the end of a, a long winter that we have here uh, in my part of Victoria. People often refer to me as a botanist or a horticulturist, thinking that those words sound a little bit more fancy than just a gardener. But I consider myself to be a gardener because gardening combines elements of botany, the, the, the science and the understanding of uh, how plants grow and, and work. But then there's also an artistic side to gardening that uh, horticulture and botany don't have. I started out as an orchid grower, actually. Uh, I began collecting orchids at the age of nine, and at the age of 12, I was already a foundation member of the Orchid Society of Canberra. And I managed to collect about 100 orchids in a little glass house which my dad built me in the backyard. Well, I guess I consider myself to be a plantsman, so I'm interested in uh, sourcing plants from different parts of the world and combining them in ways which I find uh, you know, emotionally interesting. I like a garden which challenges me, not one that's restful and romantic. I like to be challenged all the time by my garden. Well, this is my privy garden, and uh, it's based on herbaceous perennials and grasses uh, with a few bulbs and a few old roses uh, thrown in as well. And I call it my privy garden because nobody knows it's here. You can't see it from the outside row because of the hedges uh, surrounding the whole area. So the privy garden peaks in summer and at that time of the year, it's chest deep in perennials. Beautiful salvias, agastarches, penstemons, miscanthus, panicums. Um, but in the autumn time, everything goes biscuit and coffee and chestnut and gold. And it looks beautiful uh, even when it's dormant over the winter. When you design a garden, I think it's important to have an understanding of where you want the garden to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, and then work towards that to try to uh, get some kind of emotional response from your viewer. So around here, we enter the part of my garden that's designed to peak in winter, my woodland garden. And there are these gum trees which were on my neighbour's property that cast shade. So I had all this shade to work with. And so I decided to plant a winter woodland uh, filled with snowdrops and helleborus and crocus and winter flowering shrubs like this beautiful witch hazel Diane here. Uh, and autumn coloured trees, Japanese maples and uh, so forth. <laughs> Gum trees are difficult to garden under because uh, not only do they take the water and the light, but they're also allelopaths, which means they produce a toxin in their roots that tries to kill anything growing in their root zone. So the plants I've put in here have been worked out by trial and error. Whatever looks glossy and handsome and thrives during the summer is what I've ended up with. So it's things like the beautiful Fatsia japonica, which everybody thinks of as a house plant, but actually it grows really well under gum trees as well. Uh, we've got some of the little cold climate bamboos like Fargesia rufa. This is the bamboo that pandas eat in the wild. Uh, or Cuba japonica, the gold dust plant. 
uh, here with the beautiful glossy foliage. And I think this is the best you can hope for under gum trees is glossy evergreen foliage. Forget about flowers. I think gardening teaches you patience and humility. And I think the best way to learn to garden is to kill lots of plants. So just trial and error. It's actually taken me about 20 years to bulk up uh, this number of bulbs in my garden, uh, just growing them from seed and dividing bit by bit. So it's, it's been quite a labour of love. I could go and buy them, but it would cost tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and as a gardener, I, I consider it my duty to raise them from seed and to propagate them. On a gardener's income, that's the only way I can afford to do it. Well, this is my uh, food garden where I grow all my fruit and vegetables and it keeps me going throughout the whole year, even now in winter. The last couple of years I've been posting a lot on Instagram uh, to do with my garden and uh, it's been very gratifying actually. I've got a lot of very devoted followers and I've met some really nice gardeners all around the world through Instagram. I think the difference between a summer and a winter garden is that in summer, all of the interest kind of comes to you and hits you in the face. But in winter, you need to change your focus right down low to the little details or right back wide so you can see the big structure of the garden. And often I find um, pictures of the garden when it's backlit uh, do really well. And that's part of the way I garden too, is to uh, think about how things look when they're lit in the afternoon or the morning sun. There's another side to my life too. Uh, I work as a classical musician. I specialise in historical bassoons and historical woodwind instruments. I think my interest in early music and early instruments just stems from some kind of innate nerdiness. I can't really explain it. I guess my plans for the future of this garden are to uh, just refine what exists already and watch everything grow and achieve its full potential. So I hope to grow old with this garden.